I don't want to be harsh. If I wanted to be harsh, I'd probably say she's a great snake. I can be a bully. If Nora thinks I'm a bully to her, then so be it. If I don't like her, I can bully you. This episode was wild. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Let's get into this video, all right? And see how we can analyze this particular episode of The Real Housewives of Lagos. Because guys, I'm thinking of how to start, but I feel like I've literally exhausted all of my brain cells trying to follow Iyabo's way of thinking. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I feel like I have completely exhausted my cells for comprehension because Mariam at some point completely threw me into a ridiculous state of confusion. Iabos one was worse. So, let's get into this video. Don't worry, we're in this together, guys. Just picture me holding your hands right now. <laughs> and we're leading each other through this path of trying to understand what exactly happened on the episode 11 of The Real Housewives of Lagos. Because, guys, it was wild. It was wild. It was a bumpy ride, yes. Don't get me wrong, it was a bumpy ride and you need to brace yourself for all of the ridiculousness that happened on this episode. We're going to get into this video, we're going to get into this analysis and as usual, I will share with you my thoughts about this episode. I will tell you everything that happened and we're going to give a detailed analysis of every single thing. All right? And as usual, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. So please go ahead and share. And guys, we might not be able to really pocket our emotions about everything that happened on this episode on this video so please make it a date with us tomorrow 3 p.m w-a-t all right saturday 3 p.m w-a-t for our live conversation there we can spend hours forgetting our emotions because guys <laughs> my emotions are all about the place and i'm sure yours are as well and officially you are all specially welcome to my youtube channel my name is gloria elijah this is frankly speaking with gloria elijah and i am the girl with the tea for those of you that are ogs returnees massive massive shout out to every single one of you thank you so much for tuning in again to watch my analysis of the show and for those of you that are yet to become a bona fide member of this community you're missing out a lot all right but if this is your first time and you are yet to subscribe please do not hesitate to do exactly what you see on your screen all right please go ahead subscribe to become a part of this community especially if you're looking for that space where you can freely express yourself where you can get the most detailed factual and accurate analysis of reality tv shows movies and trendy social topics all right all of that juicy scoop this is where you find it all right now all of that said let's quickly proceed with the details of this conversation let's take it from the top the opening scene guys I don't want to believe that I'm the only one that felt the weirdness of that particular scene. Because, pray tell, how are Chioma and Iyabo friends again? Because, tell me why these two people claim to be friends. You know, going all chummy chummy, kicking and kakaring all the time. And even giving off of this vibe of, oh, mother, daughter, queen, mother, little princess of this tiny little unseen castle sort of relationship. And Iyabo has no idea or is probably feigning ignorance of the line of work of Chioma's bull. Oh, and Iyabo claims to have been in the movie industry for over 25 years and she has no idea that this guy is also a Nollywood actor. Or let's call him a new generation Nollywood actor. 
Guys, tell me how. Make it make sense. And you see, yeah, <laughs> even though this Chioma's Nollywood actor secret admirer story does not make sense on this show, guys, this guy completely scored all the points for me on this episode. Because he was so quick-witted to ask Yabo a valid question. Guys, this guy literally took the question out of my mouth. It depends on what you watch. What do you watch? Guys, I found myself asking the same question to Yabo. Yabo, what do you watch? So, what do you do? Oh, I'm an actor. Oh, really? The movies you've acted? Uh, depends. Uh, what, have you, what do you watch? <laughs> really what kind of movies like, do you do? Like? Because anybody that's got Netflix, anybody that watches African magic. In fact, for the international community out there, if you watch Netflix, you must have come across at least five different movies that that young man has featured in. So, there's a lot of questions for Yabo. Yes, beginning with the questions that the young man asked. What do you watch, Yabo? Oh, the other question that I personally have for Yabo is, Yabo, don't you watch Netflix or don't you have Netflix? Don't you watch Netflix? Or don't you watch Africa Magic on DSTV? <laughs> you're in the Nollywood industry, right? You're, you're an actor. You, don't you know your colleagues? <laughs> or is it only in the Yoruba movie industry that Yabo knows people? <laughs> I mean, guys, come on. Let's be for real. I felt like that was completely rude of Yabo to have asked that young man what do you do when it was very obvious that she knows him <laughs> she knows he's a nollywood actor just like her and the difference is this guy operates on a much more bigger stage on an international stage netflix he's got movies on showmax on netflix on africa magic this guy is everywhere <laughs> He's not a small player. And I also loved the fact that the guy had to chip in that little information, which is not so little if you want to think about it, guys, that he was named the highest grossing male actor in Nollywood last year. <laughs> I mean, guys, <laughs> see ya, uh, that young man completely ate up a yabos little moment of show off in fact he literally toyed with yabo's ego used it to play pom -pom and threw it away in the trash can yes because guys yabo was trying to give off this air of yes i have been in hollywood for the past 25 years i am dating polo so i am bigger and higher and more elevated I am on this very, very high pedestal. I cannot see you. You are a newcomer. I don't know. Like, guys, she was trying to give off the air of, I am the Angelina Jolie of Nigerian movies, of Nollywood. Like, excuse you. <laughs> excuse you. Scoot, scoot. Scoot away. No, it's, nah, that scene, that scene was wild. And it was a young stuttering for me. Like, she had to recorrect herself. She was like, no, 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 eh, I mean, what kind of movies do you act? I'm like, no, were you expecting him to be acting Yoruba movies like you? Were you expecting him to be a low-key player? Like, what were you expecting? What exactly were you expecting? And then Choma sat down there, like, one little doll, and she was like, <laughs> See, guys, yeah, nah, that scene, as I said, was weird. It was weird, you know, and it just does not really make sense that <laughs> you are friends with Chioma, that I'm referring to Yabo now, you know, that like she's friends with Chioma, you know, they call themselves besties and whatnot, and surely they should have had conversations about this said guy, because this same Yabo, I think in episode two or three, I'd gone to Choma's house to teach her how to make semo. Obviously, because Choma is dating a Yoruba guy as portrayed on the show. Already calling Choma her sister-in-law. Meaning, if at all Choma is actually dating someone, if really there's a real boo somewhere, it was definitely Yabo that introduced Choma to that person. And so she's standing as 
you know, the, the bridge between Choma and this person. So that whole scene, nah, it was absolute badadash. But you see that Nollywood actor, I totally loved his confidence. I loved the way he handled the conversation. This dude was not giving any desperate vibe. You know, maybe Choma and Yabo felt like, okay, if he sees Polo, he's going to position himself. He's going to try to win their hearts because according to Choma, she was taking the guy to them so that they would rate the guy. But dude was right there. He was really relaxed, completely chilled, laid back, was not giving off any vibe of desperation, was not trying to please anybody. Even when we're saying, oh, eh, Chama finds it difficult to like people. Chama does not like people. The guy was like, eh, really? Guys, I say yes. See, eh, whether they paid that guy or not to do whatever he did, However, I loved it. The next scene was Laura's discovery of a pregnancy. And guys, I'm going to be frank with you. Just like Laura, I did not know how to feel about that. You see, we live in a society where women have been conditioned to feel lucky when they get pregnant. Women have been conditioned to think that getting pregnant, having a baby, getting married being a wife being a mother is the greatest achievement of it all you know and frankly speaking for those of you that have been a part of this community for the longest time you know my sentiments about all of those conventions you know my my, my sentiments about it i'm one of those people that do not think that any of those things are an achievement not to talk of a biggest achievement no you know so seeing laura in that emotional state guys i could kind of relate not because i have walked her walk not because i have been in her shoes before but because of my own mindset with regards to pregnancy as a woman you know and also depending on the timing as well because guys it was very obvious that the timing was off according to laura six years ago she did not walk down the aisle because she was pregnant. Now, how heavy she was, I have no idea. She's got two kids already, right? And this season has shown us how excited Laura is about her wedding. Because guys, if you all notice, I've been asking you all that, okay, is it that Laura did not have a wedding before or what exactly is the situation? So in a way, she kind of, you know, explained that. And now I completely understand that, oh, just like most women's dream they want to walk down the aisle on their wedding day looking their best and their you know looking their most gorgeous self in their wedding dress they want to have the best time on their wedding day obviously laura did not have any of that and so this year in quotes on the show it's one of her biggest yearnings something she's been planning for the longest time guys we've seen different episodes of laura trying out wedding dresses you know having conversations with friends family and her husband about how perfect she wants that day to be guys we've seen all the preparations and everything her mind is there her body soul her spirit is there on that day as long as laura is concerned her wedding day should be happening tomorrow and she's ready if it's even happening at that point in time she's ready and then out of the blues she's pregnant now i know a lot of you will say that oh well nobody tied her hands <laughs> you know while she was doing the deed you know she got pregnant well she's married she's living with a man so yes there is every possibility in the books that anyhow anyhow pregnancy will happen right but look at it from this angle a woman who's been planning this time of her life for the longest time for the second time and then pregnancy comes in guys or women ladies on this channel how would you feel if you were in laura's shoes i mean a pregnancy is not a curse don't get me wrong it is a blessing for some i mean look at mariam seeking the fruit of the womb i mean guys it's <laughs> the situation is just so it's just so dicey just so dicey but you also agree with me that sometimes it's not actually it's not actually great news for some people and as i said before i could totally understand why laura was sad come on she's human she wanted her moment 
her moment to shine, to enjoy being the bride for one day. And then the pregnancy, you know, came in. And now she was talking about moving it forward. That's postponing the wedding to another year. I don't know how true all of these things are, but guys, it, these things happen in real life, you know? And that conversation, okay, not really a conversation though, but um, the video recording that she was doing, as a message to her husband guys it was so emotional because you could tell that laura was trying so hard to hold it in she was trying so hard to not look ungrateful and um, to not look like she was ungrateful because hey people are definitely going to judge her they will say that oh and uh, you you should be happy that you you are you are pregnant children's and um, pregnancies are blessings from god children are blessings from god look at Miriam. Miriam is looking for a child but guys i'm gonna let's just call it speedy speed I just felt like that pregnancy just came at the wrong time. Yeah. And as she said, she and the husband actually planned for that pregnancy after the wedding. But then it came before the wedding. Anyways, guys, as I said, I don't know how to feel about this, right? So I would love to know your thoughts about it. So please go ahead and share in the comment section below. The next thing was Toyn preparing to um, go away for three months for her surgery and guys um it was such a sad moment right and you could tell that she was actually struggling with her emotions during her confessionals and even whilst her assistant was assisting her with um the packing but one thing i really do admire about Toyn this season is her bravery you know the fact that she's going through all of that but still finds the space within her to to spread confidence to spread courage guys that that was just huge for me that was really huge for me and i don't know how long ago that scene was shot i don't know if she is done with recovery i don't know what's happening right now but i just really pray for all the best for her now this next scene was kind of funny to me courtesy of tanya yeah so laura had put a call through to chama to you know encourage her to resolve our differences with Mariam. And just as expected, Chioma had been on the defensive. She had remained adamant that Mariam offended her, Mariam had insulted her, Mariam had hurt her. You know, the same thing she complained to her mother, Yabo. Now, to buttress her point, to have a backup, she called Tanya, like kind of added Tanya to the core. And guys, I found it so ridiculous because one i wondered like tanya are you so jobless like don't you have better things to do because she joining the call i kind of expected her to have a voice say something but instead she was just quiet and she was like mm. anything chama was saying she was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know like this this is standing fan you know guys personally i don't like fans so like this standing fan you just want to be there at a distance let it just be blowing breeze and just cooling your nerves but guys i'm like tanya what's your use again what's your usefulness on this show so she was just there on the call no contributions no relevance nothing whatsoever but choma joshua called her to have backup on the call <laughs> anyways laura suggested that um Chama planned a getaway you know so as to bring the women together so that everybody would talk out their differences and they can all be at least cordial they do not all have to be friends Chama only agreed to laura's suggestion based on the condition that laura was going to be the one to invite mariam and uh, frankly speaking it made me wonder why she even bothered you know to agree with such an arrangement because guys <laughs> if there's going to be reconciliation then it could happen on neutral grounds why do i have to be the one to go through all of that stress to organize the getaway so next scene the ladies except toy were headed to the getaway and Laura had decided to stop by Mariam's house to pick her so that um, both of them could have some time to talk before they got to the venue. You know, in other words, trying to also encourage her to reconcile with the people that she had issues with in the group. And um, there was also conversation about uh, Mariam's absence from um, Toyin's fashion show. And Mariam had been very hasty 
to cancel Twin as a friend. According to her, they are not friends. She does not care about Twin. And um, the fact that Twin had been very hasty to lay hands on her, you know, and even broke her phone, that they were not friends. Twin had crossed the line. Now, I see where Mariam is coming from. And just as I've said before, for me, that is a line that should never be crossed in friendship. Um, two friends can actually argue over things. They can actually have an altercation even, but it should never get physical. And I understand Mariam Spain. She had been humiliated. She had been half naked through it all. So I totally understand where a headache was coming from. But in that same breath, I also wished that she at least took accountability for her own contribution to that whole mess. Because Tony is not a mad woman. Tony is not just going to walk up to Mariam and assault her physically like that. And this is not me making a case for Tony, but I'm saying that Mariam is not entirely blameless in that particular situation. So listening to her going on and on and on to Mariam, she was sort of making it look like she was the victim in that whole situation, like she was completely innocent in everything that had happened. And you see, yeah, still on that scene, I found that confessional to be quite cheesy. You know, the one where she was sort of comparing her status, her situation to that of twins, you know, um, that's with regards to the phone. She broke my phone, put her hands on me, even though my phone was replaced. Two minutes after. Yes, you mentioned it because I was on his bitch. Yeah, you got that right, replaced it. Um, according to her, Tony had broken her phone, but her husband had immediately replaced it in three days. <laughs> three days. And um, she had also gotten two brand new sunshades from the husband. You know, according to her, Tony had broken one particular designer brand that she had, and then the husband had given her two. Unlike Tony, who had probably repaired her phone screen other than replacing it with a brand new one. And guys, as I said before, I found it to be quite cheesy because frankly speaking, if I'm going to brag about something like that, my husband, that is if I were to be in Mariam's shoes, my husband should be replacing my phone that very day. In fact, I should be able to replace my phone that very day. As far as I'm concerned, three days is a long time for someone that wealthy to replace a phone with a brand new one. That's just my frank opinion. For me, Mariam trying to score cheap points ended up being her embarrassing the wealth status of her said husband. Because it also made me question her own financial status. Like, Mariam, don't you have your own money? Did you have to wait for your husband to buy you a brand new phone three days later? Couldn't you afford to buy yourself a phone that very day? If you wanted to really brag, if you wanted to really prove to us about how rich you are. I mean, guys, this is just my frank opinion. What is your take on this one? Now, fast forward to the beach. Shama had actually booked a room for only five people. Yeah. According to her, she was not certain if Mariam was going to be there. She wasn't even sure if Mariam was going to be invited. She did not invite Mariam and she wasn't really sure if Laura was going to go ahead to invite Mariam or if uh, Mariam was even going to accept or honor the invitation. So in her defense, I totally understand. But on the flip side, I kind of felt like Chama did that to be petty or to get back at Mariam. Because guys, if you think about it, <laughs> How did the getaway even happen? It came about as a suggestion from Laura for the sake of reconciliation. Yes, it wasn't like Choma just sat on her own and called all the ladies and invited them for this getaway. No, it, it was birthed from that conversation that she had had with Laura. In fact, Laura was the one that even called her. Laura made that suggestion. So I know it's a show, it might have been something that was actually organized by production, you know, to create that opportunity for the women to sit together and have that conversation, to create content, to create drama, I get it. But in the context of this episode now, I felt like Chama just had to be petty. Yeah, she just had to be petty. I felt like that was just her own way 
of getting back at Mariam. So it turned out that Mariam did not have a room. And there were suggestions, of course, for two of the women to share a room. So Mariam, of course, suggested that um, Chioma and her school mother, Iyabo, should share a room. Since they were besties, Laura also seconded the idea. But what I found really ridiculous was Iyabo picking offense over what Mariam had said. You know, Mariam calling her Chioma's school mother. And she was going like, I don't like it, stop it. Like she was getting all serious and, you know, she had immediately stepped into a role of the elderly one, the grandmother of all the mothers right there. And I'm like, Iyabo, for the hundredth time this season, I am asking, please tell us who the actual fuck are you again? That nobody can talk to you, that nobody can joke with you. I mean, Yama can actually throw, you know, spicy jokes here and there. And the ladies were like, <laughs> they will laugh and take it in good faith. But now she cannot take a common joke. Is she ashamed of being Choma's school mother? Is she? Guys, now, nah. I just found her reaction to be just very, very pff, appalling. Anyways, after everybody had settled into their room, um, Laura, just as she had done with Choma and Mariam, had you know, made a move to also speak to Faith, to, you know, encourage her to also make peace with the people that she had issues with in the group. That's um, Dr. Rommel and um, Mariam. Now, for Mariam, Faith is not really interested. According to her, she feels like Mariam has just been bipolar towards her and she does not have that kind of energy, you know, to handle such a personality especially the type of energy that mariam was bringing to her and therefore dr rommel she is completely done because she cannot deal with someone that always wants to source for information about other people that that is not her lifestyle and on the two occasions that she's tried having conversations with dr rommel that is exactly what he has been doing and guys that is nothing but the absolute fact we saw that happen on the show and <laughs> Faith was not lying about that. Now, speaking of Dr. Romeo, the next scene was quite hilarious because, guys, listening to this man's confessional just simply validated all what I have been saying about this man being a chronic social climber. Because, ladies and gentlemen, tell me why this man was so excited over getting the last invitation. I mean, the last invitation for that getaway. And this is not the first time this has happened. This is like the third time, actually. Because Toyin tweeted that she never invited Dr. Romeo to her fashion show, the fashion show that we all watched in the previous episode. So there's a possibility that he went there by himself. You know what they call Mogbomoya in Yoruba? You know, nobody invited you. You just had carried yourself there. Or maybe Iyabo and Choma, you know, carried him as their small portmanteau handbag to tag along. Because his excitement during his confessional, guys, it was... <laughs> oh my God, guys. You know what? They will always want to make me the center of attention and talk about me. So they now choose to invite me last. I think they realize that somebody's missing from the circle listening to him express his excitement over Choma's late invitation to that resort guys i almost gagged i almost gagged and i kept on asking myself that how is it that dr romeo does not see that to these women he's just an afterthought yes he's just an afterthought you know, where the gathering of the actual important people have happened and then just look around and they are looking for the clown. They are looking for that one person that's going to put on the shoes of, you know, the clown that will make them laugh, you know, just sort of entertain them. They now think of him and say, oh, let's invite Dr. Romeo, the clown of the group. But then this man was expressing so much excitement and even going on about, oh, it shows that there's no show without Dr. Rana. It shows, oh my God. If pathetic was a person, if desperate was a person, <laughs> it would be exactly who Dr. Rommel 
is portraying himself to be. Next scene, Iaba called her daughter Priscilla. And frankly speaking, I don't really have a lot to say about that scene. But one thing I noticed for sure is the fact that Iaba seemed more nicer, more motherly, more playful with the daughter, which is quite typical of, you know, parents and their children, right? And it made me wonder what would happen if Iyabo expressed such kindness as well to the ladies in the group as the oldest in the group. This next scene was the beginning of all the drama on this particular episode. So Chaba had put together like a whole list of things for the ladies to do for fun. And they were supposed to gather in the lounge <laughs> Sounds like Big Brother, yeah. They were supposed to gather in the lounge of the resort and Choma arrived first. Quite surprisingly, because she's known for being late. So she arrived first and then there was also Mariam. Now, I'm going to be frank with all of you. Mariam was a bit petty with the way she used uh, the back of her gown or whatever that was, you know, to flow over Choma's knees and sat down. She was kind of petty and guys, it was obvious that she was actually deliberate about doing that, yes. And Choma caught it, yes. So I felt like Mariam was just being a troublemaker at that point in time. But then the, the awkward silence that followed, oh my God, guys. You could literally slice through it with a sharp, even a blunt knife could literally slice through it, yes. But then um, Mariam <laughs> started off the conversation. And once again, frankly speaking, I did not like the fact that she kept on asking Choma, oh, nobody is here, so don't you think we should talk? And Choma said, I'm listening. And she was like, don't you think? Don't you? I'm like, girl, just go ahead and talk. If you want to talk, start up the conversation. Which one is, don't you think? Don't you think? Are you talking to a child? Now that everyone is not here, I think we should have a conversation. Don't you think? I'm listening. Don't you think? I'm listening. So don't you think it's a question? I'm listening. I did not like that, guys. I did not like that. I felt like once again, Mariam still has not learned her lessons. I felt like once again, Mariam still has not come to terms with the fact that people vibe differently. You cannot continuously try to impose your ridiculousness on other people. Anyways, she dived into the conversation by first explaining um, the reason behind the statement. She had actually explained to Choma, you know, that she felt really triggered by the way Choma had, you know, sort of caved her in to that bookshelf at Tanya's event and was sort of goading her. You know, Choma had called her a rat, called her names and all manner of things that that had really triggered her. And that was the reason she had made that statement, you know, that it was not intended to curse out Choma or to, um, you know, hurt Shema. And guys, the same explanation Mariam gave, I totally agree with it because that was the same explanation I gave that, listen, if Choma was in the same situation as her, in other words, if Choma was married and was looking for the fruit of the womb just like her and she had made that statement, then definitely it means that she was actually aiming, you know, to ridicule Choma, to hurt her feelings. But that is not the case for Choma. She just said what she said because once she was triggered and also because of the situation around that time, you know, the kids were there and all whatnot. Now guys, she had gone ahead to explain all of that and even tendered the apology to Choma. Now in the course of her explaining herself, she had also mentioned that she had had a conversation with Iyabo and Iyabo had told her that Choma had been so upset that she had broken down in tears that she does not want to be the reason, you know, for another woman to be crying over not having children of our own. So that was how Mariam had explained it. But Chama during her confessionals was going on and on about, oh, uh, she does not rate other women who would want to put another woman down by making such a statement about the woman not having a child, blah, blah, blah. You know, as usual, playing the victim. Darling, are you sorry? Or did Iyabo tell you to be sorry? Like, which one is it? I think she's only apologizing because Iyabo told her to apologize. So to me, this apology is not genuine. Guys, I was so disgusted by that Choma's confessional because I'm thinking, Choma, this woman has actually apologized to you. And here you are saying all the things you're saying, not really taking accountability for all of the things you did to Mariam that day. 
you are not even taking responsibility at all for or, or anything, anything at all. And guys, the part that even pained me the most was where she said that eh, because Mariam referenced Iyabo in that conversation. So the apology was not genuine. I'm like, oh wow, Chema, <laughs> coming from you, I mean, you would know if an apology is genuine or not. You that cannot even apologize to people. <laughs> so you can now, you think you're in the best position to know when an apology is genuine or not. Really, Chama. And as if that was not enough. <laughs> oh my God, guys. The moment Tanya joined that conversation, I knew it would lead nowhere. Because Tanya literally carried selective amnesia from her room or wherever she was coming from to that conversation. And then together, she and Choma were gaslighting Mariam, making it look like Mariam was the one that was delusional, that, oh, eh, Choma did not, you know, cave in on Mariam, did not gold Mariam. Can I ask you a question? Yes. When, that, when she walked up to me, yes? Who do you mean by walk up? Like okay. chest butt? Yeah. No. Tanya, you came into our middle. Yes, <laughs> Guys, it was so annoying. See? I almost broke my TV at that point because Mariam at that time had actually apologized to Choma, but she was also trying to explain to Choma that this thing you did, it really triggered me. Don't you think you actually owe me an apology as well for all the things you said? And guys, Choma, oh my God, Choma said that both of them actually said things to each other, but Mariam chose to pick just one one line, one thing, which is that statement that Mariam chose to pick only that one to apologize for. In other words, she was actually expecting Mariam to apologize for the whole situation. And then she would now decide if really she wanted to apologize or not. And then when Tanya joins them and Mariam was ask, asking Tanya, Tanya, you were there. Didn't Chioma cave in on me? Because Iyabotu had joined them as well. Didn't Choma cave in on me? Didn't she buck in on me? You are the one that came in between us to separate us. And I told you, no, you should be holding Choma away from me because Choma was coming in my face. Guys, Tanya instantly claimed selective amnesia. Like, she doesn't know what Mariam was talking about. See ya. <sighs> Whoever brought Tanya to this show, please, we beg you at this point here, yeah, we cannot handle it anymore. Just bundle her and throw her away to wherever you brought her from because at this point guys i cannot stand a grown-ass woman that's not just a wife but a mother that's acting like a hair head like a headless chicken you cannot open your mouth and even speak the truth for once even acting like she doesn't even know what Mariam was talking about guys that was so disgusting to watch so disgusting. Let me tell you what I remember. In time, I yes. went back and forth. And then we got outside. You said what she said. You guys went back and forth again. And then I came in the middle of both of you at some point. At what point I go sleep for? Oh! Hey! Hey, my brain. I'm so sorry. You came. Guys, I was so furious. I was literally losing my mind. Like, what? What the fuck is wrong with this guy? Like, hey. See, if I saw Tanya at that point, I would just carry her and throw her away. I would throw her away, throw her into the trash. Because it was so annoying and even mariam was so shocked and frankly speaking as much as that scene was quite annoying it was also hilarious to me because i was honestly laughing at mariam because i was thinking mariam what were you thinking were you thinking that tanya and iyabo were going to defend you against shoma like really this is the second time no this is actually the third time that such a thing is happening and you are like a girl when are you going to have sense when are you going to when are you going to develop some sense and some alertness in your brain to know when people will stand for you and when they will not stand for you you see the worst part for me in that moment was listening to mariam still refer to iyabo as her girl during her confessional i'm like this woman when will you when will you have sense when will you grow up? When will you, when will you pluck out the scales from your eyes to see clearly that this woman does not actually give a fuck about you? She doesn't really care. She doesn't. You're not her girl. You are not her friend. She does not rate you. But then Iabo actually surprised me. Yeah, 
she surprised me because for the first time this season Iyabo was able to tell Chioma the truth to her face in the presence of the other ladies and during her confessional. But if all what Miriam is saying is true, then Chioma obviously needs to also apologize for aggravating her. Hallelujah! I was quite surprised. I did not see that coming. Never in this season did I see that coming. The fact that Iyabo admitted that if indeed Choma really hurt Mariam, that she actually did owe Mariam an apology, guys, I did not see that coming at all. I didn't. Because at that point, Mariam had lost it. She was so pissed. For her, she had taken back her apologies to, Ch um, Lo um, what's her name, Choma. Yes, because Choma was still insisting that she did not owe Mariam any apologies, that she did not want to apologize, she was not going to apologize, which was just very annoying to be very honest with all of you. It was just very annoying because I felt like Choma, just seek this one out. You are wrong. You are wrong. You actually did the most to Mariam on that day. So you not wanting to take accountability for your actions, it does not make sense at all. It does not make sense, you know? So as I said, the fact that Iyabo actually you know, admitted what she had admitted, guys. I was quite shocked. And you know, because of how heated everything was at that point in time, and also to let peace reign, Iabo had, on behalf of Chema, gone ahead to apologize to Mariam, even hugged Mariam, and also apologized to Chema, which is quite funny to me because, guys, at that point, you could tell that Chema was not happy with Iabo for, you know, for telling her off like that in front of the other women yes it felt like some sort of betrayal to Choma you could see it all over Choma's face because Choma was so upset like she was really adamant that she was not going to apologize and at some point I felt like she almost wanted to cry I'm like what's this one? I better swallow all your tears we're not interested in your emotional outburst at this point in time yes but anyways um as I said Iabo apologized to both of them and she was you know vouching for peace to reign at that point in time Laura had also joined them, right? But then she caught the look on Tanya's face. Because at that point, Iaba was being playful with everybody. She wanted peace to reign. She wanted them to move away from that conversation so that everything would be, you know, resolved once and for all. But Tanya was making faces at Mariam. <laughs> oh, God. And you see, Laura caught it. And exactly what Laura said during her confessional was nothing but the absolute truth. According to her, she would avoid Tanya more than any other person in that group. Because Tanya was a green snake, an instigator, a shit starter. She would instigate things and then she would run away and wait for everywhere to burn. Which was exactly what she did, you know, when she lied, blatantly lied that she wasn't aware if Choma, you know, was caving in on Mariam or not. Guys, that was nothing but the truth. You know, looking at Tanya's face, it was kind of funny to me. I'm not going to lie. I was laughing. But at the same time, I was asking myself, can you try this shit with either Iyabo or Choma? The aftermath of that drama was the vibe for me. My God. It was Faith walking in with not just that security, but also her own bottle of champagne. <laughs> and the women giving her room to pass and sit down. The bitch resting face. You know, you know that face of, don't even bring your shit to me. Guys, oh my God. See, eh, at this point, whatever faith is selling, I am buying. <laughs> if she decides to do a master class today on how <laughs> to not give a fuck about your enemies, and now to pack all the resources you need to a function to be completely comfortable. Guys, I am paying for that course <laughs> because that was just the energy that I needed at that point in time. Away from Choma and Mariam's drama, Choma decided to introduce the game of truth or dare. And I totally agree with what Laura said during that confessional. According to Laura, that game with the women is a trap. Because every time that game is played, it means that there's a conversation that's being had by a certain cacos in the group and they need answers to, 
you know, some of the gists that has come up from that conversation. And guys, she wasn't lying. Because if you listen to the questions that Choma was asking during the truth or there, guys, hey, <laughs> see, eh, it was not far from the truth of what Laura had said at all. Anyways, first question was thrown to Mariam about her childhood photos. And she had had a meltdown because according to her, um, her mother or her grandmother's brother or cousin had actually bought you know the pictures all of it all of her childhood pictures everything you know as a result of his depression after the death of um the mother or grandmother guys i'm sorry it's completely skipping my mind right now but she completely melted down and um broke down in tears Chama had rushed to go console her according to Chama. even though she's not on good terms with certain people she cannot bear to see another woman cry Anyways, the next instruction of the game was for Iyabo to hug her least favorite person in the room. Now, Laura already thought she was going to be the person, but then Iyabo had moved on to go hug Faith. And frankly speaking, I wasn't really surprised because <laughs> if Iyabo had hugged Laura, I would say, no, there's a problem somewhere. Iyabo is probably hiding how she really feels about Faith, you know? So I wasn't really surprised when she had gone ahead to go hug Faith. And according to Faith, during her confessionals, she doesn't really care. She doesn't, you know? And the fact that Iyabo is 45 and is all proud and bragging over walking all over her train, <laughs> God, guys, <laughs> when I say Yabo is giving Agbaya vibes, guys, <laughs> shameless vibes, like shamelessness vibes. I wasn't wrong. Next question had been directed at Mariam. She had been asked about the people that she had issues with in the group and if she was going to make peace with them or even apologize to them. And <laughs> Mariam had insisted that she did not owe faith an apology. And then during her confessional, she was throwing fire and brimstone, you know, that, hey, the fact that she apologized to Choma does not mean that she's awking apology or she has free apologies to give to people, you know. And then there's this silly explanation that she actually gave. Guys, frankly speaking, I feel like I had a brain freeze when Mariam was sort of explaining herself because I, I, I replayed that scene over and over again. I thought about it. It completely did not make sense. I mean, compared to what we actually watched on the show it did not make sense because mariam was claiming in a way that she was sort of trying to defend faith against the women coming for her see that was the best i could actually get from that her silly explanation because it was just completely ridiculous it did not make sense she said oh she thought that faith thought that women were coming for her so she was trying to stand for faith and it, guys it did not make sense please if you understood what mariam was trying to explain give me clarity because i was lost i did not understand that was the part where i felt like i exhausted all of my brain cells trying to even understand what mariam was saying and i just could not understand although there was a brief moment of reconciliation between herself and choma at that point in time as well because choma finally apologized to Mariam and was all giddy with excitement that oh yes she got the apology that she had been craving for but guys I still did not understand Mariam's explanation and I love the fact that Faith put an end to that nonsense first of all can you stop thinking from because you're saying she taught she taught I'm literally right here I didn't think anything <laughs> literally we just got Wait, like listen stop speaking for me I'm here. Stop speaking for me. You thought, you thought, you thought. I wasn't even thinking anything. You are the one doing all the thinking. What were you thinking? Stop thinking for me. And guys, that is nothing but the truth. Assuming, thinking, thoughting, and look at where it's ended. And you see, yeah, just as she has done before, once again, Iyaba completely disgraced herself in that scene during her confessionals. Because Faith was explaining herself. And she was talking about how, where she's from, she had learned self-control. She's from the ghetto, but she had the opportunity and the privilege, you know, to 
be amongst people that were more refined, that knew things about life, that knew their way around life. And she had learned from those people. She had learned how to pick her battles. She had learned how to channel her energy where and when it is needed. But while she was giving all of those explanations, our auntie Yabo, during her confessionals, was having a headache over it. First, as usual, she rolled her eyes. Then she was going on and on about, eh, so now we are getting to know you now. How can you claim that you are from the ghetto and you don't know how to speak your dialect? Faith saying she's from the ghetto and you can't speak your mother's language. I don't understand. What kind of ghetto are you? And I'm like, does he ever actually understand what it means when people say that they were, they, they, they were raised in the ghetto, like they were born and raised in the ghetto? Like, is that... Hey, God, guys, I'm, I'm so tempted to say certain things but I don't want to say it. So it doesn't feel like I'm taking this show really personal. But there are things I want to say. Because it's like Eyabo's interpretation of the ghetto is like a Yoruba community where you grow up there, you must know how to speak Yoruba. I'm like, Eyabo, don't you realize that in a ghetto, there are people from different walks of life, people from different tribes and religion that actually exist in a ghetto. So what do you mean by, oh, you, you, because you were raised in a ghetto, you should not to speak it that At that point, I was already exhausted. Because once again, I'm like, here we go again. Are we going to go back to the conversation of language learning, of people learning their dialect, of people knowing their dialect? Guys, see ya. I feel like I overuse my brain every time I try to understand the Yabo because it's always like a... F because, guys... Now, even at this point, Laura had had enough of all the bullshit from these women. And so she had gone ahead to, you know, clear the air about the true status of her relationship with Faith, which is something she had actually explained before, but she had to explain it again, that she and Faith only knew each other just five months ago, and they've been talking ever since. It's not like they are best friends, but they are really good, and they've been talking, but it is Iyabo and, you know, Chioma and whoever, whoever, that keeps on, you know, insisting that Faith should call her best friend. Call your best friend. It's not like they're best friends, but they are good. And she would always defend Faith. Even if after they finish shooting the show and doing whatever, they don't hang out out there, they don't talk all the time, but she would always defend Faith. Because she likes Faith, she knows Faith, they are cool. And guys, frankly speaking, I really loved the fact that Laura explained that. But then, sadly, Yabo refused to gain clarity. You could tell from Choma's countenance and the look on Choma's face that she was gaining clarity. You could tell that from what Laura had said, from what Faith had said, Choma was beginning to see the light. But then because, of course, she's sort of Yabo's minion and vice versa. She could not really show that. So it doesn't seem like some sort of betrayal to Iyabo. So Iyabo chose to be dramatic. She's then making a mountain out of a molehill, out of that conversation. Guys, she was being all dramatic, you know, gesticulations here and there. You know, she was standing up, hey, hey, doing a lot of things, laughing sarcastically. And Laura wasn't finding it funny. At that point, Laura mentioned that she had actually apologized to Iyabo five times last season over God knows what, all because she respects Iyabo. But at this point, she takes back all of that apology because she's been nice to Iyabo, but Iyabo has been nasty towards her. So moving forward, no more apologies. She takes back all of her apologies. She does not like Iyabo anymore. Iyabo can go fuck herself for all she cares. And guys, this whole thing resulted into a heated altercation between these two women. You see, what really cracked me up was Iyaba's confessional. It was the nerve to call Laura fake, cunning, manipulative, that she does not vibe with, you know, people like Laura. You see, I found it hilarious because Iyabo saying what she said. I was asking myself, Iyabo, right now you think you're very smart. But it's funny that you've not 
shown yourself to be as smart as you want people to think you are. Because the way Iyabo described Laura with those words as fake, cunning, manipulative, and all whatnot, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been following the show since last season, you will see that Iyabo was actually describing Chioma, not Laura. All those names that Iyabo was actually using to describe Laura Guys, that is just the complete definition of Chioma. That is how Chioma has portrayed herself. Cunning, manipulative, and fake. Likewise, Iyabo herself. Iyabo has been all of those things that she's been describing Laura to be. And I just found it very, very hilarious. And guys, it was the bragging right for me over being a bully. I can be a bully. If Laura thinks I'm a bully to her, then so be it. If I don't like you, I can bully you. Saying that, oh, yes, she can be a bully. And if she does not like you, she can bully you. If Laura feels that she's bullying her, then so be it. I'm like, oh, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, if you notice, ever since I started reviewing this season two of The Real Housewives of Lagos, I've been very, very careful not to bring in a case that Iyabo is currently handling. The case of Mobad. I've chosen to remove myself completely from that case because I don't know the beginning and the end of that story. But when Iyabo was bragging about being a bully to Laura on this episode, I just could not help but think about Mubat's situation and Iyabo's role in that whole situation. And all I could do was just shake my head in disgust. Man, the worst of that moment was Iyabo charging like an angry bull at Laura, trying to hit Laura. Trying to hit Laura. Guys, I was baffled. I was baffled. I said, somebody's mother. No, people's mother. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, it was trauma. It was Choma trying to hold the yabo for me, the way she, she fell on the floor, like one lif lifeless element. Like, just... And then, Faith blocking and defending Laura. That was really cute. But you see, yeah, <laughs> the way this episode ended, nah. It was wild. It was wild. And it only makes me wonder how the reunion would be. Because already, these women are going at each other on social media. I'm not going to waste your time anymore because this video is already lengthy as it is, all right? So um, tomorrow during our live conversation, we're going to talk about the attacks. These women are attacking each other on social media. But in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, please go ahead. Let me know your thoughts about this particular episode. Share all in the comment section below. And don't miss out on tomorrow's conversation, all right? And I'll see you guys on another episode of Frankly Speaking with Gloria Elijah. Thanks for watching and have an amazing day. Bye.